you know, I'm always introduced as America's worst mom. Um, Got to have a gimmick if you want to get ahead. Uh, uh, you know, whether, whether I am uh, the worst mom or not, I guess you get to decide. Um, I am a mom. Um, and that means that I am always talking to other moms, because that's what we do. And one day, a couple years back, I was talking to my friend Melissa. And Melissa was saying to me, can you believe she did that? And I'm like, did, did what, Melissa? What are you talking about? And here's the story. Um, Melissa had been at Costco. I know Costco is a new thing for you, but it is very, very popular in the United States um, because we buy giant pallets of food routinely, um, as you can probably tell if you ever watch American shows. And um, so Melissa had been at Costco, and she was waiting in line with her pallet of the equivalent of, you have barbecue shapes, you know, she had these mounds of goldfish crackers and Rice Krispies and just the usual giant thing of groceries. And she was there with her children who were five and two at the time, two little girls. And the lady behind her in line tapped her and said, oh, excuse me, I forgot to get, uh, you know, enough tuna fish to last uh, till Mars. Um, <laughs> would you mind watching my son for a second while I go, you know, three miles back and get the tuna fish? And um, Melissa said, sure. And that's when she was saying to me, can you believe she did that? And I'm like, forgot the tuna? Melissa, I always forget that. You know, you always see me going back and forth. You just, no, Lenore. I could have taken her baby, and she would never have seen him again. And I'm like, that's, that's what you think was crazy that the woman did? And Melissa's like, yes. And I'm like, oh, let's just take this step by step for a second, Melissa, and, and see, so what, let's just think what this would entail. Um, first of all, it would require you uh, being a baby snatching kidnapper, uh, one, one of the few who already has two little children of your own, and yet wants a third, uh, you know, something that most of us use birth control for, you want this other child. Okay, so then you would have to simply turn around, uh, leave your two kids for a second, and like try to yank the kid these little boys in the, the cart, you know, yank their little fat feet out of the cart, and you're pulling them, and then you have to, like, I don't know, put them under one arm, and then you have to grab your own two-year-old, and you have to sort of shove your five-year-old along, and then you have to start going out, you know, with them, and your, your five-year-old is saying, what about our barbecue crackers? And your two-year-old is saying, why are you stealing that other lady's baby? I'm the baby. And you're like, shut up, kid, and you're going by all the other people. You're, you're leaving your groceries. You're leaving your place in line at Costco. Have you seen the lines at Costco? So you're going by all them, waving the cashier, you get there, and, and in America, because we're such trustworthy people, when you get to the final door to leave, there's a lady who looks at your receipt to make sure you're not stealing anything. Does this match with this? Like, no, we had this other lady's baby. Like, shut up, kid, we gotta go. So then you're getting out there, and, and remember, this is, this is your first baby snatching, so you're a little nervous. I mean, you're really lucky. I mean, how many baby snatchers have them just dropped in their lap in public? You know, you've been pursuing that low-yield strategy, but you got one, okay? So now, now you're like, I got one, yay! It's like the lottery. And then you're looking around for your car, and you're nervous, and you're beep, 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 finally you find the minivan, and you run out there, and you got one kid here, and you got one kid there. You open the door, and then you get the, the five-year-old can strap her own self in. That's good, but the two-year-old, you gotta put her in the car seat, and then you don't have a car seat for the baby. You know, that, that's illegal. <laughs> you know, so, so you have to, you know, Melissa believes in car seats. Obviously, she's a good mom. She's going to be a mom of three. Um, so now she has to, like, take the laundry basket. And in New York, you, like, you, have to, you have to put them backwards facing when they're till six months. But is he seven months? He should be facing forward. You know, she puts him in the car seat. And then she closes all the doors. And she puts on the DVD of Arthur or whatever. And then she's gunning it across state lines. The minivan is going room and she thinks the other lady was crazy <laughs> so that's my big question when I talk about free-range kids who is crazy the ones who think we can trust our children in the world for maybe a couple of seconds when we don't have our eyes right upon them like a maximum security prison or those who assume that pretty much everyone, uh, including themselves, <laughs> is a predator, pedophile, baby-killing nutcase. Um, so when I heard this story, I'm a New York City columnist. I had a column back then, before my paper died. Anyway, 
We won't get into my other story, my sad personal journalism story, which you can hear at length at over drinks later on. Um, <laughs> I did write a column about Melissa's story, and I thought it was going to set the world on fire because it was so obvious we're going through this weird parenting moment, right? And so I typed it up, I sent it in, it gets in print, New York Daily News, and I got um, three emails. Um, two saying, someday you're going to be America's worst mom. No, <laughs> how did they know? Um, no, and one from my elderly admirer on Staten Island, the really least glamorous part of New York City, um, 80-year-old guy, and he said, she wasn't crazy, but I'm crazy for Lenore Skenazy. And, you know, he... <laughs> he, he I love him. <laughs> he writes to me. I love him. Um, so that was it. It fell into uh, the dust heap of history. And... Um, Nothing else happened. I continued writing my columns until a couple years later, uh, my nine-year-old um, at the time, Izzy, started pestering me and my husband, would you please take me somewhere? I swear to God, this was his idea, not ours. Would you, not even my book agents. Um, would you please take me somewhere and um, let me find my way home on the subway? Um, so my husband and I looked at each other. We have an older son who never asked this. So we had to think about whether this made sense to us as parents and, and for him as a kid. We thought, well, you know, we are on the subways all the time. This is how we get around. This is a normal part of our day. It's not the taking of Pelham 123. I've never seen John Travolta in the subway. I've never seen Will Smith. I've never seen an alien. Well, I've seen illegal aliens, but I've never seen um, a, like a supernatural alien. And the rats don't have guns. So it's just a, a rather normal place to be crowded, busy, and, um, and our son is very familiar with it too. He can read a map. My husband sat on the ground of our living room and made sure you know, understand what the subway lines are, and he did. Um, if you ever wonder why you can't get a map in New York City, it's because for a while he was collecting them all. You know, he's one of those kids. So he can read a map, he speaks the language, um, you know, he sort of knows his way around. We decided, okay, yeah, let's let him do it. And so one sunny Sunday, um, I took him to Bloomingdale's, which is the fanciest, schmanciest store um, that just happens to sit right above a subway station. And um, I said, okay, today's the day, and he was very excited. And I left him in the handbag department um, because, yes, to me, it seemed a little amusing. Oh, I left my son. Oh, silly me. <laughs> Where was he again? I just saw this beautiful bag. Oh! <laughs> um, <laughs> but I left him there deliberately because the handbag department is right near the door, and when you go out the door... You're in the subway, basically. And, and he knew this was the day, so I said, okay, and I went the other way. And sure enough, he went down in the subway, and he talked to a stranger who said, oh, I'm going to bring you to Melissa. You know, this is just great. <laughs> She's been waiting. <laughs> right. Now, he said, he, my son said, is this the way downtown? And the guy said, no. How scary is that? No. He actually gave him directions. You go up and over, and he went up and over, and he went down. And he took the train downtown for maybe 10 minutes, Got up on 34th Street, miracle on 34th Street. He took the bus across by himself, my nine-year-old, and, um, and got home, you know, maybe 45 minutes later, and he was just happy. He was pleased. He had done something finally. His parents let him do something grown up. And me, with my keen nose for news, honed by years of tabloid experience, didn't write about it. Um, because it wasn't a big deal. It was just something nice that he'd done, you know, just sort of like, would you write a column about when your kid finally rides the bike? You know, you would if you're one of those columnists who writes about everything about your kids, but I, fortunately, at that point, hadn't become one of them yet. Um, so, uh, so I didn't write about it until like a month later when I was staring at a deadline and I didn't know what to write about, and interestingly, I had a woman editor finally. I said, uh, how about I write about um, my son when I let him take the subway by himself when he was nine? because, um, you know, I talked to some of the other fourth grade parents and they thought that was, seemed a little early or whatever. And my editor said, sure, that's a nice local story. And, and here I am in Melbourne, okay? <laughs> so I wrote about it, blah, 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 I let him take the subway, I don't think everybody's so terrible, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that night the phone rang and, um, and it was a guy from uh, the Howard Stern radio show. Uh, I, 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 I hear a ripple which suggests to me that you know the, who Howard Stern is and generally the tenor of his interviews, which you'd think uh, would involve me, you know, taking off many layers, beginning with my 
my scarf and ending with nothing at all for him to be interested in me because that's what Howard Stern is writing about strippers. He likes strippers and um, I, I can't even say in front of these darling little girls, um, you know, for another another 10 years, they won't know. But that's, that's the Howard Stern show. And I was just surprised that they would be interested in this story because it seemed a little offbeat. Um, I, I hadn't sold him into sexual slavery. I had simply put him on the subway. Um, so then... <laughs> Later on, uh, the, put the phone down, the phone rings again, and it's the equivalent of your Sunrise show calling. And I'm like, that's, that's quite a, a, a gap there. You know, unless you are uh, Tiger Woods' mistress, um, most people, you know, you, you wouldn't be called by both shows. So it was my first hint that this was a story that resonated with people. And sure enough, um, two days later, I had been on um, the three major networks in America and our equivalent of the ABC defending my parenting choices and trying to say that I wasn't America's worst mom. Um, but while I was on the ABC show, um, one of the callers called up and he couldn't talk to me directly because I was such a loathsome pimp who had put my son in uh, hell uh, just to get a column out of it. Um, so he had to talk to the host. And he said, what he didn't understand is why that woman uh, had wanted her son to have one day of fun and freedom that would probably end with him uh, raped, murdered, dismembered, and possibly eaten um, when she could have given him a long and happy life. And I'm like... They seem like the same thing, you know, six of one, half a dozen of another, long and happy life, raped, dismembered, and eaten. I don't know, you know, I have a spare son at home, you know, I, I really wasn't worried. I needed a column, you know, why would I worry about sending my son into hell? So the fact that people were thinking of me like that, that every conversation went to, why did you put your son in danger, made me go home and start my blog that weekend, and I called it Free Range Kids. And... It was there, it says right on the side of it, I haven't changed the word since I put it up two years ago, it's like, I love safety. I believe in safety. I want my kids to be safe, I want all kids to be safe. I believe in helmets, car seats, seat belts. When, when the intrepid subway rider turned 10 and we had a football party for him and uh, you know, at the end you give everybody a goodie bag, did I give them candy in their goodie bags? Did I give them a toy? I gave each Little darling child, a protective mouth guard. And I, I, I personally boiled them in the kitchen and then blowed them off so it wouldn't burn anybody and stuck them in their mouths so that they would be perfectly formed around their darling little teeth so nobody would get hurt. So the idea that I embrace danger was so bizarre to me that I wanted to explain I love safety. I just don't believe our children need a security detail every time they leave the house. Well, it wasn't until I started that site that I started to hear even more about how nervous we have become as parents today. Um, what I didn't realize, because I lived in New York City, is that in the suburbs, um, like where I grew up, where we used to walk to the bus stop and you'd wait for the bus to take you to school, parents now drive their children to the bus stop. And they don't even then let the kids out. They, they wait at the bus stop to make sure the bus and not the boogeyman is going to come and pick them up. And then when each child is on the bus, then they can drive off. And in some neighborhoods, the bus doesn't go to the bus stop anymore. The bus stops at each individual house. Like the kids are like, <laughs> it's like vomiting. By the time they get to school, they've made so many stops. And what do the parents do to show they care and to keep their kids safe? If, if the bus is stopping there, what can you do? You drive your child from the garage to the sidewalk. They do this. I mean, I heard about it once or twice, and I thought, is this true? And I asked on my side. I got 200 letters. Yes, it's true. Parents are driving their kids from the house to the sidewalk and waiting for the bus to pick them up there. And that's getting to school. Pick up is insane. In states across America, 
at the end of the day, you know, the few kids that are trusted to go on the bus, you know, by the parents who don't care, those kids go to the bus, right? But then the rest of the kids who are the pickup kids are herded together, like, like in a bomb shelter, down into the gym. And then the parents start lining up, parents, let's be honest, the moms start lining up um, around a half an hour before school lets out because there's so many of them. 50% of American kids now get picked up after school. That's why it's called pickup. It used to be dismissal. Kids would be dismissed. Now they get picked up. So the cars are in a huge line. And then ding, 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 it's the end of the school day. Okay, so the first car pulls up to the front of the line and there's a person standing there in the parking lot. And I always imagine it must be the gym teacher. But it's somebody there who works at the school and she's got a walkie-talkie and on the dashboard of the car is the name of the kid it says okay okay uh it's the gym teacher k k sorry <laughs> k k caitlin's mom caitlin's mom is here okay caitlin's mom is here okay caitlin's mom is here okay oh caitlin your mom is here caitlin come on okay caitlin is grabbed from the gym she's escorted out they go down the corridor they go outside the door is open for caitlin she's shoved in like obama the door slams <laughs> out goes caitlin okay sydney's mom is here sydney's si si somebody's mom is here okay she go got sydney sydney is rushed out there, thrown into the car, the next one, okay, Jimmy's mom is here, okay, Fred's mom is here, okay, go, go, and it just seems like there's, like, helicopters and sniper fire and explore, it's like the fall of Saigon, get out while you can, go, go, for God's sake, go, and that's just dismissal at normal American schools. It blew my mind to hear how afraid we are for our children these days, and I heard just example after example. Um, in England, the Boy Scout boys can no longer carry pen knives, okay? In America, where they can, um, one scout leader was teaching the kids how to whittle. You know, this is how you take a stick, duh. And uh, you take a knife, and he showed them how to whittle, and then each child was handed a potato peeler. Okay, right? Because you can't be too safe. Just can't be too safe. Girl Scouts, on the other hand, are still allowed to toast marshmallows, provided they have one knee on the ground. Why? Otherwise, they're all toppling into the fire. We were just having, you know, generations of Girl Scouts going up like Joan of Arc. <laughs> and on and on it goes. I just heard an amazing story today. Listen to this one. This is really sad. Uh, a journalist here whose name is Caitlin, which is why it came to me, told me that her friend, who's male, was here in Melbourne at a grocery this week. Is you raising your hand? Um, and he was, you know, he was shopping. Imagine that. Um, not actually there to prey upon children. And um, <laughs> he was going down an aisle, and he saw a little kid in the cart, and he waved at the kid in one aisle, and then, boop, wouldn't you know it, the kid comes down this aisle with the mom, and he sees the kid in the other aisle, and he waves again, and by the time he's in the next aisle, the manager came and said, we are asking you to leave. <laughs> you know, you can laugh, but that's the way we're thinking about every interaction these days, as if any human interest in a child must be perverse, as if the children are in danger when they're with their mom at the grocery and somebody is waving. That used to be considered nice, and now it's considered scary, if not downright criminal. So what I wanted to figure out is, is it just my imagination, or have things really changed since when I was a kid? And I was doing my research and I was hearing all these stories, but I am middle-aged, and middle-aged people always tend to think things were better when they were kids. And then I found the smoking gun that proves that childhood really has changed, or at least what we think of as childhood and the way it should be has changed. And that is, I got the DVD of Sesame Street Old School. It's a two DVD set, and it shows the Sesame Street, um, highlights of Sesame Street from 1969 to 1974, the first five years they were on the air. See, I've, I learned my math from Sesame Street. Five years, 1974. Um, and so uh, it shows stuff that seemed very familiar. It shows um, kids playing follow the leader, and the leader is not, you know, getting her PhD in follow the leader studies. She is actually another six-year-old. Um, it shows kids playing in a vacant lot. They haven't put that soft Pepsi mat stuff on the ground yet. It's a real vacant lot, um, or at least it looked like it on Sesame Street. And, and the kids balance on a beam, and there's one of those giant pipes, and they shimmy through the pipe. There's, there's like nobody sleeping in the middle of the pipe. You know, 
know, they go through the pipe, they come out at the other end, and they're just having a grand time, and they're not supervised, they're playing, you know, remember that playing thing? And, and before you see any of this, a warning appears on screen at the very beginning, and it says, the following is intended for adult viewing only. Sesame Street could not endorse the very childhood, you know, they didn't take home movies and put them on the screen back then. They went out and they were trying to model childhood for children back then. They were trying to show what was healthy, what all the child psychiatrists and psychologists and educators thought would show a really healthy, happy childhood, and they could not even endorse their own Halcyon days, as they're sunny days anymore. I, my friend actually works at Sesame Street, and I asked him about this. He's a lawyer. How embarrassing is that? I said, you, you guys, didn't you feel like idiots? You know, you can't endorse your own Sesame Street anymore? And he said, yeah, there were a lot of discussions. Of course, there were a lot of discussions. I'm sure they're paid by the hour. A lot of discussions, <laughs> and finally, they just couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. So when I went to write my book, I really wanted to figure out how did we get to the point where a little girl walking down Sesame Street, um, you know, meeting the neighbors was now so horrible that we were all scared for her and that we thought Mr. Hooper was probably a creep who should be sent out of his own grocery store. So um, I, I did my research and I came up with what I think are four things that have changed since um, we were kids um, compared to now when a lot of us are raising kids. And the first one is very obvious. It's the me, me, the, Media, media, you can say it, it's the media, come on, don't, don't you guys routinely blame the media like we do? I mean, <laughs> that's like a national pastime, um, and it's our media, you, you should be blaming us. Um, so yes, the fault is the media, because it has changed dramatically. When my parents were raising me, I am so old, um, did you guys have Marcus Welby? I mean, like, that's what was on TV, remember? The patients lived, <laughs> right? <You know? laughs> Nobody sued, <laughs> right? Marcus Welby patted them on the back, nobody said, don't touch me, you know? It was a totally different era. And, and when they watched the news, the news actually had a beginning and an end. <laughs> Imagine that, it didn't go on for 24 hours a day, like it does now. And when you have 24 hours to fill, you you really have to come up with some great story that will keep people tuned in. And as it turns out, the greatest story for the news media that they have ever found that will keep us on edge, that will keep us so sad and so gripped that we have to watch the TV, it almost feels disloyal if we turn off the TV, is the story of a kidnapped child. And when I first got here, I don't know, I was telling this to Carrie O'Brien, if I may name drop. Um, the first, I, find, I turned on my TV in my hotel room here in Sydney, and I, I recognized the footage. I was like, I've seen this footage before. It was the footage of J.C. Dugard, who had the very tragic history of being snatched from a bus stop in California, not on this continent, not in this hemisphere, um, at age 11, and, um, and finally being found again at age 29. Um, why was that story a story here? Um, because it is so rare you had to import it. It's like saffron. It's like something that you will go to the ends of the earth to get. Why do we all know the name Maddie McCann? Maddie McCann wasn't even in my country. She wasn't in your country. She was in continent number three. We've got three continents covered with the story of Maddie McCann because it, is, it fits the perfect template for the story that television wants to tell us. It was a girl who was white who disappeared, who had kind of well-off parents. And that is a story that they will go and, and they're laying off my friends right and left, but these stations have enough money to send the camera crews out there when that story happens. And it gets to the point where, I found this out after I re researched my book actually, there's something called mean world syndrome, which I wish I'd known about first, which is that the more TV you watch, the more mean you think the world is. And it's not just because we keep seeing these stories over and over again. It's because you see Maddie McCann, and then you see an ad for tomato sauce. And then you see J.C. Dugard, and you see an ad for toilet paper. And the mundane stuff mixes with this very rare stuff, and it starts feeling all mundane. It starts feeling like it's all just part of the fabric of life. And like when I told my friend about the, the Izzy story, she said, because she lives in New York with me, she said, of course he's safe here because she's 
familiar with New York, she said, but aren't they getting just snatched off their bicycles all the time in the suburbs? I mean, it really feels like because 24-7 we see these children snatched on TV, we assume that we open the door and that's what's happening outside. And, and it's not just the news media that reinforce this. I mean, there's all those television shows that we gleefully export to you, like CSI and Law and Order, and Law and Order, and, and there are Law and Order, and then <laughs> there's Law and Order. Um, and so the night before I was writing my chapter on the media, I decided, let me just randomly see what's on TV. And sure enough, <laughs> what a surprise, Law and Order was on TV. And it wasn't even SVU or whatever, you know, the one with the really cute victims. This was only the moderately cute victims. Um, but still, I watched, um, you know, nothing else on. I'll watch the moderate Q ones. And, um, and the plot was this. Uh, a girl was coming home from school, of course, and who should be lurking um, but ye old Serbian war criminal? Uh, <laughs> because nothing says friendly neighbor, you know, like a Serbian war criminal. Well, next thing you see, she's been dragged off the street. She's in his basement. Her arms are, you know, tied above her head like that by, by a phone cord, which shows you it's fiction because who has a phone cord? Uh, but anyways, so, so her hands are tied. She's lying down. There's a blindfold over her eyes. There's duct tape over her mouth. And all we hear are <laughs> horrible, terrifying, awful, guttural sounds. And we see the man's hand reaching to go between her thighs and then cut to the, you know, the tomato sauce commercial, you know, because that's entertainment. So then, um, you know, the worst of the worst happens there. And then I'm watching CSI. Um, forget about the news where it had somebody on fire and somebody else who killed himself. But CSI finally comes on. And I, I must admit, I am slow enough. I could not follow the plot one iota. But I can tell you the basics, which are that... Um, the, the red-haired guy was down there in Miami. And, um, and of course, there was a body in the swamp, and they had to pull the body out of the swamp. And then I think they count, like, the maggots to see how many days it had been there, or they cut through the maggots. Somehow the maggots were very involved in this story. And, and then some guy, then there's a key, a very important key to, like, a bank account or something. But a guy has a key, so he's not going to give the key away. So instead, ha-ha, he swallows a key. Who can swallow a key? He swallows a key, and they want to get the key. So what do they do? They take a knife. Somebody takes a knife. They slice open the guy. Oh, look, I got the key. You know, so they got the key. And then the next thing you see, you're in somebody's bathroom, and a lady is being drowned like this. It's the same soundtrack all the time. And, and then she gets her head out, and you're like, oh, thank God. And then, oh, she's back down again. Don't want to waste the soundtrack. And finally, oh, my God, she gets out, and you're so happy. She's saved, but she's so dazed. She's, like, twirling around, and she ends up, ah. She impales her breast on the towel hook, you know. I, I hate it when that happens. You get up, you're feeling good, you take your shower. Oh, the breast, the to towel hook. It's just terrible. So that way they get to show breast, you know, but it's all to the point for the, for the plot. And so it was just like this disgusting mess of maggots and blood and death and gore and breasts and towels not having a hook, um, you know. <laughs> amazing to me and and I was very happy to find a study that looked at this mess and it looked at it was from the Mayo Clinic very prestigious clinic back in America that um, looked at two seasons of crime on CSI and two seasons of crime in that thing uh, uh, real life that's it real life that that thing out there that you shouldn't go to it's so scary um, and they compared them and they found three big discrepancies one is that um, on TV, uh, you rarely see drunkenness as a reason for crime, drunk, drunk or high people, because it's such a boring plot point. This guy got drunk, that guy got drunk, one of them hit each other over the head with a bottle, you know, and that's it. And it's, it's a boring story. So alcohol is really downplayed, and so are drugs. Two, in real life, minorities are way overrepresented as victims of crime, but not on TV, because the advertisers want the white kids. But the thing that changed our parenting the most, or I think had the biggest impact, is that in real life, and I think you know this, um, the majority of crimes against children are committed by people they know, people who are in very close proximity to them. They're family members, step family, trusted friends. 90% of the crimes against them, that's who causes them. On TV, it's the opposite. On TV, it is always the hulking Serbian war criminal 
or it is the clever, fiendish mastermind who is the only person on earth to go on Facebook and actually look at all your reunion pictures so assiduously that that's supposed to be like, oh yeah, they were great. Oh, yeah, I looked at them all. Who would look at them all? Nobody ever edits their pictures on Facebook. It's so boring. But um, anyways, he couldn't be dissuaded by the 57 out of focus shots. He looked at 58, which has your child in the background, maybe with a t-shirt that says her name, Kaylee, on it. And now he's thinking, oh, that tree is familiar. That's from a, that only grows in North Carolina. And he's Googling to figure out exactly where you live. And he's going to travel across the country from California to get your supremely adorable child, because that's the only child he could ever be interested in, this pedophile. And you start thinking that there's either creeps or masterminds out there the second you open the door. And on TV, they are always outside the door. So that's, I think, the media's role in making us much more afraid as parents. The second thing that changed is that we are living in really litigious times. And I don't think you guys are quite where we are, um, and I hope it doesn't happen. Um, but we are very aware of the legal consequences of everything and the possibility of being sued. And that has infiltrated the way we think so that we start thinking like lawyers before anything has happened. Um, this week, Fisher Price, you guys know Fisher Price, the big toy maker? Did you see this? They just recalled 10 million items. Because, and it was like things from high chairs to toys to, I don't know, you know, I've been like on crazy time here. I didn't read the story quite as well as I should have. But um, the point is that over the last 10 years, um, 14 children have hurt themselves, um, seven of them, I think, needing stitches on these various items that Fisher Price sells. There was something protruding, like if you knocked yourself against the high chair, you could end up scraped, and some of the kids ended up needing a couple stitches. Nobody has died, but 14 children, 10 years, 10 million items now recalled as if they're dangerous. When when that becomes the threshold for how we think of as danger, when to me, that's living in wonderful times with items that you can totally trust, it, you know, because otherwise I could scrape myself on this and hey, hey, I could sue the, you know, thinking like an American, I could sue the Wheeler Center and then I'd have enough money to come back. Um, but, <laughs> but that's how you start thinking. If everything is considered unsafe, um, we start taking out everything out of childhood, and that's actually what's happened in the states. Um, park districts are afraid that parents will sue if a child falls off a swing, and so they're getting rid of swings. They're not rid getting rid of so many swings. They're making them, um, you know, very safe with a lot of um, mulch around them. But what they have gotten rid of are the merry-go-rounds and the teeter-totters. I always hated teeter-totters. I was always like, you know, this skinny little person who couldn't get down, you know, tormented by my friends um, who wouldn't let me down. But anyways, you'd want the opportunity, if your kid was a bully, to at least have a chance to get, you know, get their yayas out on a teeter-totter. They can't anymore. Now they have to go on the bus. So um, <laughs> I torment the children there. So there's no more teeter-totters. There's no more seesaws. And um, like at my son's school, at the end of the year, you got to remember, we're in New York. There's this exciting thing where the kids go out to this stuff called nature. Um, and they actually spend an overnight in this weird stuff with like trees and, and like bugs and the sky. And, um, and for a lot of children, it's a very exciting event because it's their first time out of the city and it's an overnight. But when the assistant principal was explaining it, um, to all the nervous parents in the auditorium, the hands shot up, you know, how far are they from a hospital? Oh, that's a pleasant thought. How far are they from that? You know, who's going to break their head open first? How far are they from the hospital? Um, will they have phones with them? Will they have, you know, and like, yes, there's a phone. You can call the center. It's like, no, what about when they're on their hikes? And it's like, well, they'll be taking two hikes. Does my child have to take both hikes? You know, it was really, it was on and on. And the poor vice principal finally just like to deflect all the nervousness said, hey, listen, something really great happens. On the night that they spend there, before they go to bed, we have a bonfire. Bonfire! Bonfire! Are you crazy? He's like, wait, 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 no, 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 no. Stop. 
I know what you're thinking. You know, Girl Scouts. No, it's um, the, the deal is uh, the the fire's there, but um, the children seat 25 feet back, and and there's a row of benches between them and the fire. And it's like like benches don't catch on fire, you know. But I mean, it's like great. They're gonna have the bonfire, and they're gonna be like shivering back here with their freezing cold candy bars, never melting because we're too afraid to let them experience any life because God forbid, what if I don't want to be sued? I better just take it out before it ever happens. And that's how we're constricting their lives. So the litigiousness of society seems like it might be outside of our child rearing practices, but it actually has a very direct impact. The third reason that I think that we're so different is that there's now this expertise culture. And I think you're keenly aware of it, that um, from the second you find out that you are pregnant, um, congratulations, you're going to have a liability. <laughs> Mazel tov. Uh, you, you start feeling like there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And, uh, you know, the the, the people I blame the most are from New York City. The people who wrote um, what to expect when you're expecting. You know, is that a big thing to look at? Oh, people are just cringing. I love it when you cringe. Cringe away. They deserve it. Um, what to expect when you're expecting lays forth the premise. By the way, it started out as uh, the first edition was 300 pages. Second edition was 400 pages. 500 pages. This is the fourth edition. It's 600 pages. And it actually says on the cover, now with more symptoms than ever. It's like, yes. Thank God. You know, I thought I was going along. Oh, wait, wait, my little toe will hurt. Oh, my God, you know, you better have bed rest. Um, so the what to expect people tell you that um, every single thing you do, every single second, since you got the little notice back, and now, of course, it's like what to expect when you're thinking of maybe expecting someday and you're like 12. But anyways, what to expect once you know you're having a baby is that you better do everything exactly right or... It's all your fault if the kid turns out bad. And, and it actually tells you that um, you should worry about each bite you take. The, the early edition, uh, you know, to give them credit, the early edition said, put down that forkful. They actually said, put down that forkful if it wasn't like quinoa, uh, you know, mixed with spinach and made into a yogurt shake or something. But now they just gently suggest that each bite, bite, not meal, bite, uh, during the day, is an opportunity to feed that growing baby of yours healthy nutrients. Uh, duh. Um, but anyways, what can you get if you do each bite with the quinoa? Um, you can expect, quote, better birth weight, improved brain development, lower risk for certain birth defects. That kills me, because what that is suggesting is that if you sat at home and there was that night when you could not resist one of these meringues like that you guys are obsessed with everywhere. My God, I've never seen a country so crazed about meringues. I've been taking pictures to bring home because I want to open a meringue factory before it gets to America, because we had cupcakes first, but you guys have meringues. Okay, so, so if God forbid, instead Instead of eating the spinach and, you know, yogurt shake that you were about to gulp down with such glee, you reach for meringue instead, and your baby ends up with a birth defect, it's your fault. It's your fault. I hope you don't mind. You just screwed your baby's entire life because you had to eat a meringue, you know? It's, it's really terrifying the incredibly tiny line that they make you walk. And nobody can walk that line, so you know that you're going to be blamed, and you're going to blame yourself. And that's just before the baby is born. Once the baby comes out... Everything is up for grabs. There are row after row of books. There's this one book. I just hated the title. It said it's called The Happiest Toddler on the Block. It's like, ha-ha, you have the second happiest toddler, but I, mine's happier. Happy! He's happier. Really happy. So, um, shaken baby syndrome. So, um, the, what does it say in these books? It tells you how to have a conversation with your child. And I swear to you, there's one section that tells how there's a whole section on how to tell your, like, how to talk, I'm going to say this cryptically because there are children here, how to talk about the tooth fairy, okay? Nothing, nothing. How to talk about the tooth fairy, um, which we all know, she comes and brings money. Anyway, um, <laughs> there's a whole other section on how to, look, at you guys are drawing? Can I have one of those drawings? Perfect. This is incredible. Okay, and um, so what you have to do is you can't say, 
That is a beautiful drawing. I'm sorry. I didn't say it. I didn't say it because now she's going to think she's Picasso. She's going to get an inflated head. She's never going to draw again because that was her green and blue period. And she'll never, ever get back again. So forget it, you know. But I can't say, like, uh, crown, um, octopus. So what is this? I can't tell what this is. Draw something. I couldn't, say, I couldn't say that because, of course, that would be cruel and that would crush the incipient artist inside her <laughs> until she was in a tiny fetal position and you were back to eating quinoa. So <laughs> what you have to say is this, literally. Listen to me, Yumi. You have to say, it says, take a couple moments. <sighs> Okay. I see you used green and blue. <laughs> like your green and blue dress. See, that shows that I'm respectfully relating, and I'm, I'm paying attention to her, but not too much attention, but not too little attention, just the right attention to show that I respect her and her incipient creativity, not too much, not too little. I can't say, uh, my friend put it this way, she said, they think that there's a huge difference, like if you say, good job, you know, they're gonna go forth and conquer the world, good girl, and you've screwed it up, because now you've put the worth on them, and you don't have a normal relationship anymore, they think that you're judging them on who they are as an artist and that's all your love belongs to and cares about and it's just so crazy every conversation they they say they're trying to help but they make every conversation feel like it is the make or break conversation that you are having you know with your super duper harvard goer or your psycho killer depending on which words you chose so they can just totally drive you crazy and the one thing, I, the, the, the happiest toddler one, says when you're talking to your child and they're disappointed by something like, say, like there, we were eating cake back there and it wasn't so great cake, you can't just say, yeah, yeah, I know, it's bad cake. What can you say? You have to say, oh, sad, 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 cake stunk. You know, you have to, like, you have to get into it. You have to relate. Uh, it takes all the spontaneity out of being a parent, and it also assumes that anything that you would do naturally is wrong. So there's this fine line, and we are all always missing it, and that is the third reason that we feel so scared of what we're doing as parents. But my fourth reason is the favorite. It's what I call uh, the baby safety industrial complex, and I brought you a couple of examples. Actually, I'm going to use this, I, I want to use this thing on you that I've never used on anyone else. First, I just want to read you this one section from my favorite whipping boy. You, you must have magazines like this. I know I'll never get a freelance job from them again. Um, Parents <laughs> Magazine. Do you have, like, you have magazines like this, right? This is what to bring to, to baby-proof your vacation, because nothing says vacation like terror and fear. Um, <laughs> visiting family or friends this summer? Their home may not be a safe place for little ones. Ask about potential hazards. Oh, yeah, we have the alligator. Uh, you know. <laughs> and what special equipment they have so you'll know what to bring. Suggest, oh, guess what? A guy who does safety proofing for a business. Um, you'll want to know where your baby or toddler will sleep. An adult bed or the floor is not safe. Uh, an adult bed or the floor is not safe. Because you could fall off the bed and... And what happens on the floor? <laughs> Nothing happens. They're on the floor. That's a good place for them to be. Put a couple pillows around them. It's so obvious that the floor is safe. They're here they are blatantly saying the floor is not safe. So you'll need to bring a portable crib and your baby monitor, because I'm sure you're going to be light years away from your baby in somebody else's house. Um, an adult bed of the floor is not safe. Okay. Uh, if there are stairs, what should you bring? Guess, right, bring along stair gates. That's, that's not hard to carry when you're carrying the baby and the, uh, the crib. Just bring an extra set of stair gates. Okay, other items to consider. Covers for faucets and door handles. Plastic zip ties to secure cabinets. An inflatable tub for bath time because nobody's ever had a sink in their house, right? You couldn't use a sink by that age or a bathtub even. You know, you wouldn't want to use a bathtub. Um, an inflatable tub for bath time and a nightlight. And this is what kills me. It says, if you don't want to lug too many gadgets around, I was like, just skip it? No. Uh, rent short-term equipment. Rent 
it. Can you believe it? This is, this is one of the things that just is insane. This whole magazine is filled with stuff that you don't need, that you would never have thought of, that they're selling you, right? I mean, they have to make you worried about the floor, which is really hard to do, but they've, they've done it for some people, right? Before you're going to go out and buy a special inflatable crib or whatever or rent one when you're there. Okay, so now, back to my regularly scheduled scorn. Um, <laughs> anyone know what these are? What are these? Uh, uh, those of you saying baby knee pads, have you read my book or do you have baby knee pads? You just guessed it? You guessed it? Everybody else says tennis bands, wristbands. You guys are advanced. Um, yes, these are baby knee pads because, you know, when you were deciding how to decorate the nursery, you chose crushed glass. You know, <laughs> bad idea. I mean, otherwise, you know, why has crawling become so dangerous? These. These are, I love this, this is an earth-friendly item. Earth-friendly, except that it exists and you don't need it at all. Um, other than that, it's really earth-friendly. These are called table toppers. And table toppers are portable, oh my God, they're starting to rip, this is my favorite product. Um, these are portable placemats, like, I, mean, I guess most placemats are portable, but anyways, they're little, um, they're disposable placemats, let's say. Um, and they provide, here's what it says. <sighs> on-the-go protection from germs, dirt, and cleaning chemicals on restaurant and food court tables. Oh, you got it. Yeah, the funny thing is, they provide protection from germs, dirt, and cleaning chemicals. So your baby is in danger if you go to the food court and there are the meringues, you know, still piled high with the cappuccino you guys are constantly guzzling here, you know, slathered on top and, and the maggots from CSI, you know, are, are festering there. Or God forbid somebody wiped the table clean, your baby is in danger from the cleaning chemicals. So what this is trying to tell you is that your baby is in danger every single second you go out to eat, you leave your house. Once again, they're trying to bring wash you into thinking your child, unlike any of the 300 million years of human evolution till now, can't sit at a table and eat something without dying of horrible germs or cleaning chemicals. But, but this is my very favorite. This is my, my whipping boy. It is the baby bathwater temperature duck. Now, this duck is really good because if you have a baby and you want to put them in the tub, you put this little duck in the water, and then you wait a couple minutes, and then you turn it over, and if the word hot <laughs> appears on the duck, then you know that that water is that that temperature that's like bad for babies, that you shouldn't stick your baby in, um, because you couldn't possibly stick your own hand in the water, and if you swish it around a little and you pull it out again, and there's only bones <laughs> left, and like there's stuff in the water and it smells like chicken soup, you know, maybe it's hot, but this guy tells you if it's hot. So, so let's just read the directions. Hmm, how do we use this? Oh, you stick it in the water, wash it in warm water, blah, blah, blah. Oh, wait. Oh, caution. Hmm. I'll read the caution. Caution. Adult should always place hand in bath water to test the temperature before placing baby in tub. <laughs> so, this duck is trying to convince you that you are too stupid, even though it knows better than you that you aren't. It knows that you can do the job and that this is completely superfluous. But when you walk around Babies Are Us, a store that did not exist when baby was me, there are, there are 10,000 items in there trying to convince you that your baby is physically in danger, that your baby is dramatically in danger, and that you are too stupid or too cheap to keep your child from getting scalded to death between today and tomorrow, and you'd better run out and buy something or take some class or do something dramatic or just give somebody some of your money and buy that inflatable baby tub, or you are being a terrible parent. So you take this all together, and that is why we parents are being driven crazy. But in reality, when I do all these radio interviews particularly, the, the topic that comes up most often is predators, okay? And I just want to address that for a second because the fear of predators is really changing us dramatically too. Um, 
Do you guys know who Dear Abby is? You know, Dear Abby, she's the advice giver, terrible, terrible advice giver. Here's some of her terrible advice. Um, what she suggested over the summer is that every morning when your child is going off to school, you just whip out your cell phone and you take a picture of your kid. Why? Why? Yes. I see this hand. Oh, yes. Exactly why. She wants you to have the picture to give to the police when your child is snatched and you never see him again. Besides that, we have a Kip say picture of, you know, this was my child at seven. Um, it's, her idea is that the world is so dangerous that every single day when your child is leaving the house, there's a good chance, a good enough chance that you should be prepared that they will not come home. When we think that way, we start thinking about everything in terms of pedophiles and predators. And what I heard um, just recently was this lady wrote to me and, and I put it on my website and I asked is this happening all over and it was I don't know if it's happening here yet she said that when she takes her kid to a very small preschool in her church in a small town um, they have decided to spend all their money this year any money that they make through the PTA in coming up with one of those systems where you press the pin number before you can get in the door to bring your kids in so first of all, they're not spending their money on toys. They're not spending money on you know, giving to the daycare center down the street that has no money. They're spending it on this item. And she said, it just doesn't seem necessary. There's always two adults in the class. We all know each other. It's a small town. It's a small class. Why are we doing it? And then I got this flood of letters from people saying that that was happening at their daycare centers, too, and their preschools. And then people wrote to me that, like, when they go to their preschool, if they if they knock, you know, they, they punch in their numbers and they open the door and in they go. And I'm standing behind there, say, with two babies, you know, the twins squirming around. I, you, you in front of me have to say, sorry, Ugh. and slam the door in the other person's face because that's the way the security system works. Everybody has to punch in their number. And when we think that way, when we're being prepared and we're thinking ahead and we're thinking the worst first and we think we're being smart and savvy and good parents um, and safe, what we're really doing is destroying the thing that keeps kids safe and happy and healthy and it's called community. If you're slamming the door in my face, even though you've seen me come to that daycare center for the last six months and you know my kids and my kids want to say hi to your kids, but no, the security system says this will be compromised, it's the opposite of the way we want to be. And what happens when we live in a world that is like that, where we have come to trust no one outside our front door? Well, here's a letter I got um, over Christmas. Uh, it says, Dear Free Range Kids, I'm 15 right now and get pretty much no freedom. I'm limited to what's inside the house and the backyard. I can't even go as far as the sidewalk. I might be abducted or killed. I used to walk to the bus stop, but my dad said it was too dangerous, so he started driving me to the stop, and eventually he just started driving me to school. Today, after playing video games for two hours or so, I went downstairs and realized the only things I could do were eat and watch TV. Watching TV, playing video games, and eating junk food are fun and all, but even after even just a few days, it gets old. I don't want my kids, if I ever even have kids, to live like me at all. I feel bad for that kid, but I also feel amazed that it's completely ironic because obviously the parents are afraid of the child getting kidnapped, and what have they done? They have kidnapped their child, right? He's safe from everybody else, but they have kidnapped him. So what can we do to start breaking through all this fear and all this unnecessary hovering and worrying and terrorizing ourselves and our children and start giving them back the quote-unquote dangerous idea I have, which is an old-fashioned childhood, a childhood like most of us had, where you walked to school, where you went and made your own play date, where you knocked on your friend's door, and if they weren't there, you knocked on somebody else's door. Well, a sixth-grade teacher in New York wrote to me and said, I'm going to have my kids do a free-range kids project. And what her proposal for them was that all they had to do was choose something that they felt like doing that they hadn't done yet that seemed a little grown up something that they thought they were ready for, but they hadn't done yet. And this was just to goose them along a little bit. The kids were 11. And so then I came in, she had me come in, and I, I looked at all their projects. And some were completely pathetic. And I can say that because I'm um, a hemisphere away, and they will never hear. They were terrible. Um, some kids, like just the three children, um, fried an egg. 11-year-old, they fried an egg. And one kid wrote, I was terrified I was going to burn down the house. 
Uh, amazingly, she didn't. Um, uh, then other kids, like, would, you know, they walked around the corner. Um, they did, uh, you know, one kid bought a magazine. Um, but then one kid came up with an idea, and she told her mom, she said, for my project, mom, I'm going to, she lived in one of these huge apartment buildings in Manhattan, I'm going to knock on the doors of all the other um, apartments on our floor and meet the neighbors. And the mother said, what? You're going to do what kind of crazy thing? And she said, well, I just want to see who's there, and they could get to know me. And she's like, no, you're not. And she said, Mom, very clever kid. This was a school for very, very gifted children. She said, Mom, what if there's a fire? Don't you want them to know that I'm in here? And the mother's like, oh, God. <laughs> Damn it. You know, fire, predator, fire, predator, extra credit. <laughs> My daughter's in magnet school, you know. Uh, finally, she said, okay. So the kid knocked on the doors, and because she's at the magnet school, she hadn't realized there were two other girls on her floor her own age. So she met her neighbor. She started doing exactly what I'm talking about, creating community. But my favorite project was this girl who decided to bake an independence cake. And she wrote this big poster, how do you bake an independence, you know, they, they can never fit it all on, how do you bake an independence cake? <laughs> and. Um, how do you bake an independence cake? Well, what she decided to do was that she was going to go to the grocery store by herself, without her mom, without anybody, for the very first time, uh, about a half a mile from her house. And she was going to use her own money, buy the ingredients, come home, and bake a cake. So um, she said, she started out on her trip, and she wrote on her, on her giant poster, she said, um, on the way there, everyone looked angry like they were going to reach out and snatch me. Believe me, getting there was no picnic. But she got there, okay? You know, despite the, you know, sort of Wizard of Oz type <laughs> journey down the path. And, um, and then once you get to a grocery and it's your first time, it takes forever, right? You gotta find where's the eggs and the butter and the, you know, the different um, ingredients, the flour. And finally, she, she got it all together and she's standing in line. The lady behind her taps her and says, excuse me, would you watch my baby? No, <laughs> wrong, <laughs> wrong, wrong story. Not, it doesn't all fit together quite that neatly. No, so finally, she gets to the line and she pays with her own own money and she's leaving the grocery store and she said uh, the way home seemed much shorter and more pleasant because I was already used to the walk and that is my entire point here tonight we can give our kids the baby knee pads the baby temperature duck the Mandarin lessons the tutor the the SAT preparation for college help with the essays get them to college and move into the dorm next to them but what we really need to give them what changes the world for our children and makes them part of it is a chance to get out there and do something on their own. The world changed from a snatching, kidnapper-filled, angry world on her way there, the world that she'd been told it was, to on her way home, the world as it really is. People smiling, people beaming, herself feeling happy and at ease and at home. And that's why I'm asking you tonight to consider this very dangerous idea. Try to consider raising a free-range kid. Thank you very much.